original sin and the reparations issue right now for this to be and to leave black Americans the most important issue right now in America. Um, and as many of you know, St. Paul was one of the handful of cities that passed reparations resolution, which now is an ordinance and is now a permanent part of St. Paul. Mm. On January 13th, the St. Paul City Council passed Resolution 2177, which apologized for all the threats about military slavery at Fort Snelling, apologized for the destruction of the Rondo community near the I 94 freeway, and apologized for St. Paul's role in practicing institutional racism against its black residents. But also committed to creating generational wealth for the American citizens of slavery, who reside in the city of St. Paul, and is set up a limited term legislative advisory committee that's created the St. Paul Recovery Act Reparations Community Ordinance, which is an 11 member commission that will make short term, medium, and long term recommendations on how to address the racial wealth gap in the city of St. Paul. And as you know, Minnesota, or those who might not know, Minnesota has the biggest racial wealth gap in the country behind Washington, D.C. and Wisconsin. Mm. Minnesota also has a $20 billion surplus. <laughs> uh, Dred and Harry and Scott were held in bondage at Fort Stilly in the early 1830s. At any given time, there were 20 to 30 slaves at Fort Stilly. So Fort Stilly is not a couple miles away from there. It's also a military um, base. And the United States military would pay soldiers a stipend to take care of their slaves. Even at one point in time in American history, the United States military was the biggest employer of slave labor. Mm -hmm. uh, Dred Scott and his family, Harriet, he had a daughter named Lizzie, uh, he had another daughter, too, um, were owned by, were enslaved by several slave masters here in the United States. The first person Dred Scott was enslaved by was Peter Blow from Alabama. And Peter Blow took Dred Scott to St. Louis, and then Dred Scott was uh, Enslaved by John Emerson, who was also an army surgeon. Um, Dred Scott eventually sued for, uh, in Minnesota, I think he was enslaved by Tristolo, who was an army agent, too, when he was at Fort Snelling. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Dred Scott sued for his freedom in 1846 in St. Louis Circuit Court, and he was successful. But then it was overturned when it went to the Supreme Court. Um, and he sued Sanford, and right now there's a merger being talked about with Sanford Hospital, and Sanford or and things like that. So when um, the Supreme Court overturned the decision with Dred Scott, and the reason was about four of the Supreme Court members were also slave owners. Chief Justice Robert B. Hayes what was which was, uh, was also a slave owner, and he said he agreed with Sanford that the right to sue because Dred Scott was not a United States citizen because Dred Scott was a slave, it was the property of another person. So that's why uh, Dred Scott's uh, case was overturned. In May of 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention. Their goal was to outline the entire government of the United States, and their biggest challenge was representation. During this time, slavery was still a major issue in the United States. In most southern states, the enslaved population made up a large percentage of the total population. Since a significant amount of their population was made up by slaves, southern states wanted their slave population to count towards their representation in the House of Representatives. The higher the population, the more representatives they would receive. On the other hand, the 
Slavery, a lot of people think that we're just talking about the South and that slavery was just in the South. But as we can see, Dred Scott was here in Wisconsin with the Free Territory. He was also here in Minnesota with the Free Territory. And um, Aiken was a slave owner from South Carolina. He had a huge rice plantation on about 1,400 acres and he had about 700 slaves. Aiken came and invested here in Minnesota. Um, when the University of Minnesota was having some tough times or some financial difficulties, Aiken gave the University of Minnesota a loan to help them get back on, the feet, on their feet. At that time, the University of Minnesota was only for one building. And they were struggling with Aiken. The slave owner came and gave them a loan to help them get back on, on their feet. Um, so even though slavery wasn't in Minnesota, money that was gained from the slave trade, well, there were slaves in Minnesota, but there were also rich slave owners who came to Minnesota and invested in Minnesota. And I want to refer you guys to a book called Slavery's Reach by Dr. Christopher Lehman from uh, St. Cloud and documents a lot of this uh, history. Slyvanus Lowry was a slave owner from Kentucky who came here and his, his father had about seven hundred slaves. His father came here also, his sister came here, and all of them brought slaves with them. Slyvanus Lowry founded the city of St. Cloud. Then he also became the mayor of St. Cloud. Okay, so he was a slave owner, came here with slaves, with money that he gave from slavery, and then he established a township. And in those townships, Law, there's rules and there's regulations, right? And Slyvanus Lowry, he was also in the Minnesota Senate. So he was a part of establishing St. Cloud. He also established a newspaper that was pro slavery and it was called The Union. Today, that newspaper is called The St. Cloud Times. So that paper is still with us that Slyvanus Lowry started. Um, called The Union, it was pro slavery, now it's called. St. Cloud Times. Alexander Ramsey was appointed governor of Minnesota by President Zachary Taylor in 1862. Ramsey said to the Minnesota legislature, legislature, the Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond his borders. Ramsey invested with Louisiana-based slaveholder Thomas Winston in the St. Paul Mutual Insurance Company. And the St. Paul Mutual Insurance Company insured slaves, just like MetLife, just like a lot of other, just like Aetna and other insurance companies would give slave owners insurance policies for their slaves, like you have car insurance today, or you have housing insurance. At that time, they had slave insurance for people who owned slaves. In Alexander Ramsey, who was the first governor of Minnesota, invested in a company that was doing it. Um, and also, he was creating the laws, but he also had the mind state to say exterminate human beings right? and, and drive them away from their land. 
and he's one of the founders of the state of Minnesota. Uh, Ramsey County, so this is not me saying this, this is what Ramsey County said, and this was in 2008. Ramsey County did an anti-racism audit, and Ramsey County still has an anti-racism team, but Ramsey County's Ramsey County, according to Ramsey County's anti-racism audit, Ramsey County's policies and procedures harm the people that society fears the most. We know that the people that society fears the most look like George Floyd, look like Breonna Taylor, look like Marcus Gold, look like Amir Locke, look like uh, a lot of black people who have been murdered and killed by the police, and many of those people were unarmed. So. According to Ramsey County, not just police, but then housing discrimination, employment discrimination, how Ramsey County deals with people with human services, child protection services. So Ramsey County told us in 2008 that their policies and their procedures are the people that society fears the most, and the people that society fears the most are black. So when we go back and look at Alexander Ramsey, when we look at Joseph Lowry, and we look at uh, Aiken, who were some of the founders of Minnesota, anti-blackness is the foundation of Minnesota's government institutions because they were founded and established by slave owners who didn't look, who believed that we were three-fifths of a human being, who believed that black people were animals. Right? So, those policies and procedures that harm the people that society fears the most have led to what we have today, which are called disparities. Okay? Uh, the racial wealth gap. So, Minnesota, like we just said, Minnesota has one of the biggest racial wealth gaps in the country. And according to Demos, the lineage wealth gap is substantial and is driven by public policy decisions. And the public policy decisions are made by lawmakers, the people who make laws. Um, whites have hundred trillion dollars worth of wealth nationally, and blacks have about three trillion dollars worth of wealth. Blacks have three trillion dollars worth of wealth not because they're young, not because you're stupid, not because you're lazy, but because of policies and procedures that were made by our government and our lawmakers, starting back with Alexander Ramsey, starting back with Joseph Lawrence. We also had what's called here in Minnesota racial covenants. Right? So racial covenants are, in, according to the movie or to the documentary Jim Crow of the North, 100% or 90% of the racial covenants were targeted at black Americans. So racial covenants would be like, uh, you can't sell this house to a black person even if they can afford it. And then when you can't buy a house where you want to, uh, say you can't buy a house on Lake Bay even if you can afford it, when you're forced to buy a house in North Bay Gaffin, you're not going to get the same amount of equity as you would if you lived on Lake Bay right? And then people take that that money from their houses and somehow they can send their kids to school or college. They can start a business or whatever they need to do. That was taken from black Americans here in Minnesota. And there's a map that made her make a racial that says Negro smoke. And that's what a lot of black people were forced to do. The racial wealth gap in St. Paul shows itself in the home ownership. In home ownership. Uh, this is from 2013 to 2017 census of census record in uh, the world of uh, home ownership is described as you living in a place that you control, not paying rent to somebody else, somebody else's property that somebody else, somebody else control. And our white counterparts here in the city of St. Paul at this time had 61% were homeowners when uh, about 16% of black Americans are homeowners. And again, not because you're dumb, not because you're stupid, not because you're lazy, but because of policy decisions that were made through 
institutional racism here in the state of Tennessee. So, the George Floyd uprising of 2020, we were working on reparations here in the city of St. Paul uh, before George Floyd happened. We were working on it before COVID happened. And, uh, but the, what happened with George Floyd, even with COVID, COVID kind of showed us that reparations really needed to happen. The New England Journal of Medicine said that if reparations were in place, that the black community would not have been impacted the way it was by the COVID-19 pandemic. We lost about half of our black businesses during the COVID pandemic. Black people were hit extremely hard by COVID. I think we were hit, hit the hardest. Uh, but the George Floyd uprising started here in Minnesota that we was the biggest um, movement in American history. 15 to 26 million people attending uh, BLM rallies in the summer of 2020 uh, here in Minnesota, across the United States, and even uh, in other parts of the world. There were BLM George Floyd protests, and that also gave us um, a chance to talk about reparations and why reparations is so important. So we knew what happened to George Floyd was not just an easy issue, we knew that what happened to George Floyd was also an economic issue. The police were calling on George Floyd over a $20 counterfeit bill. And the, whoever called the police on George Floyd, if they did call the police on George Floyd, they would have lost their job. So it was an economic issue of the economy. Uh, on top to the bottom, but it, it caused, it also let us get, start talking about the reparations issue and gave St. Paul a national and global spotlight on the reparations issue. One thing about George Floyd is he is an American descendant of chattel and slavery, and so his lineage dates back, goes back to slavery. George Floyd, George Floyd's great grandfather was enslaved. Her great grandfather was talking about Angela Burrell. Um, Hillary Thomas Stewart was a slave, so that's George Floyd's great great grandfather, Hillary Thomas Stewart. Uh, he got his freedom at the age of eight and settled near Greens Goldsboro, North Carolina. By the age of 21, Stewart had accumulated 500 acres of land and married a woman named Marcina, who buried them 22 children. <laughs> so the Perry, like the Perry family, George Floyd, the group people called it Perry. You know, so the Perry family is big, big. His great granddaughter said he did the best he could to build a legacy for us, talking about Stuart who was enslaved. White farmers settled their land. The couple couldn't read or write, and they were powerless to fight back. His great granddaughter said he was stolen from them. So, what happened with Hillary Thomas Stewart happened to a lot of black Americans here in the South, and even as we talk about with Rondo, how the land was taken from black people, and people were given pennies on the dollar for their houses or their businesses. Down South, people would just go down, take your land, and sell it like they did here. Um, black Americans have lost 90% of our land from 1901 to 1997. So. And again, land and real estate is a way to uh, create generational wealth. You can hand down the farm or hand down the real estate to the next generation. And for black Americans, that was uh, taken from us. Also, you can grow food and you can sell food and you can be a food supplier. And that was also taken from us. So our livelihood was still from us. And also, you can grow healthy food and have access to healthy a lot of black people, like on the east side, you have food deserts. On the north side, you have food deserts. People have one grocery store to go to, or corner stores. I love our corner stores, but we're not always big as you know, the food options. Racial 
quality are reverberating well beyond the U.S. Huge rallies in the U.K. this weekend were peaceful, apart from some violent flashes. In the city of Bristol, a statue of a slave trader was toppled. And as Crystal Demancy reports, it's calling into question who we choose to celebrate. Mm -hmm. A firestorm of reaction after protesters of all colors toppled the statue of Ed Unclosed. I think that it has been um, idolized far too long in the city. Well, I think that is utterly disgraceful. And that speaks to the acts of disorder. Disorder. Was a 17th century merchant who made a fortune buying, transporting, and selling people. Mm -hmm. On Sunday, people took turns rolling his bronze statue down the street and hurled it into the harbor. While police were there, but didn't step in. We made a very tactical decision that to stop people from doing the act may have caused further disorder, and we decided the safest piece to do in terms of our policing tactics. An official investigation has been launched, but the mayor doesn't appear to be troubled by what happened. It would be a threat in the harbor, and that almost this piece of historical poetry where you know, a man who undoubtedly had uh, slaves thrown off his ships uh, during the, the passage at some point ended up under water. There are several petitions calling for a statue of a prominent black figure to be erected where Colston stood for 125 years. Seems such a formidable presence, and yet the least thing we're going to do is going to seem quite effortless. Colston's statue will be retrieved from the water and likely put into a museum. Mr. Lamancy. So I just saw um, before we open it up for discussion, I just want people to know, when I was growing up, there would be like Minnesota to all these lads. We do big lads, but right now we're first. So I think we're going to set an example for the rest of the country. So the discussion we have here today and going forward and some of the decisions that our reparations commissions make will have implications locally and as you see with the office. International. So, uh, what we did here shows you that was in London. Uh, so, what we do here will have uh, implications. 